let me just recite some things that I find sometimes frustrating in life. In terms of, because we've been talking, we were, we're, we were in Romans 13. How does a transformed believer uh, respond, relate to the ruling authorities, right? That's what we've been talking about. And so uh, we've kind of jumped out of Romans. I don't say kind of, we have jumped out of Romans from that. It was a springboard in a sense. Uh, we dealt with all of Romans 13, and now we're looking at the entirety of Scripture. And we are looking at how we're to respond. How are, how are we to be good citizens? How are we to, as believers, interact with and respond to leadership in our, in our nation if it's ungodly? And so we'll be in 2 Corinthians 5.20 and 2 Timothy 2, 3 and verses 3 and 4 today. But here's what I was thinking about this week. I, I, you know, the, the, the government, and I'm just going to be very generic, okay? This is, this is not a rant about any one party. This is just government right now, okay, what I'm finding. They continue to spend at record levels. I mean, the national de debt, if you divide it out between all the citizens, it's about $933,000 per citizen. That's our, that's our national debt. Uh, inflation, it is depreciating the dollar to the extent that, you know, your salary isn't going as far as it used to. The border, it is being overrun. 1.5 million illegal immigrants, well, we're not anti-immigration, but the illegal immigrants, 1.5 million just from January to March. I was looking yesterday at the, at the counter. By 9.30 yesterday alone, there were 4,500 illegal immigrants that crossed. China, growing incredibly emboldened and antagonistic. Russia does not seem to be backing down in the Ukraine, and we're not quite sure. It doesn't seem that we have uh, a, a strategic exit strategy. The Supreme Court justice, a Supreme Court justice, cannot define what a woman is. Businesses are being sued for following their religious convictions, group identity has become more determinative than individual character and merit. Murdering babies in the womb seems to be, it's just a matter of women's health, it, as, as the culture says. Transing kids is leading to gender altering surgeries, and that is becoming considered life-saving care, to use their language. And, and my question, how did we get here? If you weren't depressed when you came, you probably are now. And maybe a bit frustrated. Now, but, but, but here's the thing. I want you to, the feeling you're having right now, don't raise a hand, but how many of us automatically in our minds and hearts began to blame certain rulers, certain leaders, certain political figures, and it was just immediate. We're like, well, so-and-so, well, they, well, so, I mean, I find myself frustrated by these things, but then I'm reminded of what G.K. Chesterton said when he said, he, there was, a, um, I, I think, a, an article in the newspaper that he was responding to, and the article in the newspaper uh, was titled, What's Wrong with the World? And I just made, I just listed a whole bunch of things, right? But G.K. Chesterton, uh, he said this, and go to the next slide if you, there we go. No, nope, that's not it. Um, Dear Sir, regarding your article, What's Wrong with the World? I think it was my fault. I don't think I put that slide in there. My bad. Dear sir, regarding your article, What's Wrong with the World, I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. And I'm reminded of, of the New Testament church that in Acts 17, 6, the opponents of the New Testament church said, you guys are turning the world upside down. There was an impact 
from the local church merely from the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I read things like what R.C. Sproul said when he said, the only way the kingdom of God is going to be manifest on this earth. I'm going to say that again. The only way that the kingdom of God, the ways of the kingdom, the values of the kingdom are going to be made manifest on earth before Christ comes, because they are going to be made manifest uh, in a full way when Christ comes. But the only way they're going to be made manifest on earth before he comes is if we, we manifest it by the way we live as citizens of heaven and subjects of the king. And so, I'm, I'm, you know, when I get frustrated that all these things are going on, I wonder to myself, has the church stopped shining? Has the church ceased? And, and I don't mean by being a political right. I don't mean by being some force of, of politics. I mean by living life day in and day out as a citizen of the kingdom of God in a way that the world sees it and says, oh my gosh, that's attractive. That's what I'm looking for. You see, politics, I heard uh, something yesterday uh, that, that atheists are more politically engaged than evangelicals. And one of the reasons was given that, that politics may become a sort of a, a religion to an atheist. They don't have religion, and so that becomes their, their religion. But, but see, that, that is a substitute, and it is a poor substitute. It is a temporary substitute. It is an unsatisfying substitute. And if they would see the real thing lived out through the church, they'd want the real thing. And so the question is, what does kingdom living look like? It, it, and I have to be really frank. It's a bit vague and, you know, if I say, you know, live like citizens of the kingdom in the earthly kingdom. You're like, you're like I, 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 I don't even know what that looks like. I, I get that. I, I get that it's, 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 it's a bit abstract. And so last week we began by looking at it and saying, well, the one way to see kingdom living is that we are citizens. And what does it mean to be a citizen? Well, citizenship in general is being a law-abiding, productive, and responsible member of a society. And so to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven would be to be a, 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 a law-abiding, following God's rules, productive, being fruitful with uh, fruit of the Spirit, uh, evangelistically, and a responsible member of a society, doing what's expected for that group of people. We looked at Philippians 3, and we saw that kingdom citizens do some really specific things. Kingdom citizens, if I am a kingdom citizen, if you are a kingdom citizen, you're going to cherish the cross of Christ. It's going to produce a humility in you. You're not going to be like, I don't need the cross. You're not going to be an, an enemy of the cross, to use Paul's language. You're going to say, oh my gosh, I cherish the cross. It is my righteousness. It is, it is my, my means of, of, of access to the kingdom of God. Uh, another thing kingdom citizens do, we are headed towards life. Paul says of those that aren't in the kingdom, their end is destruction. But ours is not. It is life, life eternal, and it's not just everlasting. It is, it is a quality of life. It is knowing God, and that's what we were created for. That is what is satisfying, and I know it's hard, I think, even from, I say even for me. It's hard for me sometimes to really appreciate the satisfaction that comes from knowing God. Uh, I think it's because I'm so distracted sometimes. We're headed for life. Uh, there's a quote by a guy, um, I, I, I don't remember who said it, but I, I he said, we're not in the land of the living headed for the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying headed for the land of the living. Well, that's our end is life, life eternal, life abundant, life perfected. Citizens are also ruled by Christ, not appetites. Paul said that those who are not in the kingdom, they're not citizens of, of the kingdom of Christ. They're ruled by their bellies. Their God is their belly and our God, our appetites of all kinds of appetites, and we've, God gave us appetites. They're a good thing. You know what they do? They keep us from starving to death. They keep, they, they, 
the, uh, the appetite, um, certain appetites keep us, the, the human race, from dying out, right? They're, so they're good. They're God-given, but they're not to be Lord. And so if you're a citizen, if I'm a citizen, we're not going to be ruled by our appetites, but by Christ. Kingdom citizens resist and repent from what is shameful, and we're upward focused, looking for Jesus' return, wanting to be ready. We are hopeful. We are contented. We are joyful because we know what's coming. The question is, can others discern our citizenship just by looking at the way we live? Can they tell where we're citizens? Jonathan Edwards, uh, he's a preacher in the, in the great First Great Awakening. I believe it was the first. Um, the He said, the seeking of the kingdom of God is the chief business of the Christian life. Seeking the kingdom. So when when frustrated with the way things are down here, when you find yourself feeling that frustration and, and you begin to blame, just stop blaming and go, am I displaying my citizenship in the kingdom of God? Am I displaying the way life is going to be in heaven? in the here and now, uh, and proclaim the only good news that can transform this broken world one person at a time. Now listen, I, I want you to be, don't hear more than I'm saying. I'm not saying that our goal is to change society by living like citizens of heaven. That's a fruit, right? I, I want us to live like citizens of the kingdom of God and when the world sees that, one person at a time, they're going to want Christ, and it's going to have impact on society, all right? We're not trying to set up, though, a utopia here because our utopia is above, okay? But there's a second role. Oh, I, I think I have another quote there, uh, slide five. I think it is. Let them see what life will be, be like in heaven, by how we live on earth, so that they will long to be co-citizens with the saints. That's what, I, that's, that's what we want. We want them to come alongside and to, and to bow before our king, Jesus. All right, so now there's a second role, though. Citizenship in the kingdom. People need to be able to see where your citizenship lies. But the second role is as ambassador. I think it'd be cool to be an ambassador. You get to travel abroad, live in another country, you know, hang out at the embassy. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, this is what it says. 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we're ambassadors for of Christ. And we know that phrase, right? It's a a, a good church phrase. Uh, But but really, think about what that means. We represent the views and values of our king. So that means we have to know the views and values of our king. Jesus um, should have our loyalty. See, our ultimate loyalty isn't to an earthly government. It's to Jesus. We speak for him and we point to his glorious greatness in everything we do. Well, what don't ambassadors do? And what don't they? Sometimes it helps to look at the negative. What don't ambassadors do? Well, they don't badmouth foreign leaders. So as an ambassador of Christ's kingdom, we're representing him, but we're living in a foreign place where, where our citizenship is only temporary, right? But, but, but we're living in a foreign land where we are strangers, in a sense. Our job as citizens of the King of Kings is not to badmouth the local leadership. In fact, that's what it, Paul said in Romans 13. Submit to them. Ambassadors also do not disregard foreign laws. I mean, yes, they have... A, immunity, but but it's not like they go around breaking the laws of the country they're in. And so we're to be the most law-abiding, respecting, law-respecting citizens as we live here in this foreign place, so to speak. 
Ambassadors don't promote anarchy or lead a coup to put their king in power. Our king has all power. And by the way that we live, it's, um, I, I read one article, it called The Influence of the Church is a Grassroots Movement. It happens through relationships, person by person, when you and I impact this world for the kingdom. And it changes it. And ambassadors, um, they simply represent and speak for their king in a foreign place. In fact, we were created, if you look in Genesis, why were we created? We were created to bear the image of our creator in this place. Right? There's, there's heaven, the presence of God, and there's this earthly place that God made. And, and we're to, we are made to bear his likeness here to his glory, to spread his glory. And in Christ, we once again are called and enabled increasingly to bear that image again. As ambassadors, what should our message to the ungodly rulers be? I want to take you back to Psalm 2. This is, I think, an incredibly timely passage of Scripture for us as Christian ambassadors. Look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. It's on the screen also. Just looking at the first couple of verses there, the second and third. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, earthly rulers join forces to declare we don't have to do what the Christian God says. We're breaking his bonds over us. He can't tell me what to do. Does that sound like some of our current Leaders, our current culture that says uh, they, well, for, they decry Christian morality as a standard. They say it's archaic, it's outdated, it doesn't apply to us. We'll love whom we want, identify as we want, and kill the unborn when we want. God's demands, his commands, his standards, we're going to burst those bonds those restrictive bonds. And I want us to look at God's response. So you'll need to be in, in Psalm 2 right now for this. Psalm 2, verse 4, 5, and then 6 and 9. Look at what God says to them. Those rebellious earthly leaders, what does God say to them? It starts out, he says, he chuckles. That's the James Boyd free-running paraphrase. But, but it says he laughs at them, mocking them for thinking they had any authority apart from God. Every ruler on earth has authority only because God gave them that authority. And so when they say, I'm a king in my own right, I don't have to abide by this concept of God or his standards, and God laughs at them saying, you have no power. Um, it's what Jesus said to Pilate. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you. You would have no authority over me if it were not given to you from above. And God laughs at them. And in verse 5, it says that God speaks to them in wrath and fury. Now, you can read that but we don't get it. What r God's holy wrath and fury looks like. And that's how he speaks to them. And then in verse 6, he said, I have established my king, and the nations are his inheritance. King, kings of the earth, you're not so big. I've established my king, my singular king, my son, king of kings. And his inheritance are all the nations, not just your, your measly little corner 
of the world that I put you over. And then verse 9, it says, He will destroy wicked rulers. Judgment is coming. That is what God says to wicked rulers. But, last time I checked, you are not God. And I am not God. We are not his king, his anointed. So how are we to respond to those ungodly rulers as God's ambassadors, right? That's how God responds. Those are his value judgments, his truths, his plans. How are we to respond? Well, look at verse 10. And I do have a slide for this. Verse 10 now, therefore, O kings, this is the psalmist speaking now, right? Now, therefore, O kings, speaking as an ambassador, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What is our posture, our message? What do we declare as ambassadors for the king of kings? While we're dwelling here among leaders that sometimes are ungodly. Number one, we plead with them to do what is smart. Kings, you better be wise. Wise up. For, I mean, that is gracious for us to say that. They need warned because we know what's coming. Second, we warn them to do what is right. Three, we, we beg them to serve the Lord with fear and joyful trembling. Rulers, leaders, presidents, senators, congressmen, governors, mayors, fear God in your ruling, in your leading. Fourth, and I love this one because of the, the Psalms are, are poetry, and I just love the poetic expression, kiss the sun. Your, your version may not say kiss the sun. It may say show homage to the sun, show reverence to the sun. But the, the Hebrew is pretty clear, kiss the sun. Because in that culture, you would come and you would show honor and reverence and deference by kissing the ring, by kissing the hand, by something like that. And so, do what's right, serve the Lord with fear and trembling, and compel them to love the Son to avoid His wrath. And then finally, we share with them the truly blessed way of living, the kingdom way of living, the way of living that, that comes only through Christ, the way of taking refuge in the Son. Blessed are all who take refuge in the Son. That is our message as ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says the same thing. It makes the same appeal as an ambassador when it says it is God making his appeal through us. We implore you be reconciled to God through Christ. Be made right with God. In Christ. Do we also confront their injustice? Well, yes. But I want us as a church to aim higher than that. To aim at their hearts in prayer. To aim at them with gospel sharing. Uh, there's a, a passage in Acts 25. Paul is before Festus uh, and Agrippa and his wife Bernice. And it would seem that, that Paul is just a prisoner in chains giving his appeal, that he's the victim, he's powerless. From an, from an earthly perspective, that is true. It looked that way. But you see, in light of what Jesus had, had told Ananias in Acts 9.15, Jesus, remember Paul had the Damascus Road, he went and lived with, for, a, for a little bit with Ananias, and, and, and God said to Ananias, he said this, he said, Paul, this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, to kings, and to Israelites. 
So it was Paul's call to go to kings. So here in front of Festus and Agrippa and Bernice, even though he's in chains, he is no victim. He is an emissary. He is an ambassador. And this is the fulfillment. I mean, his imprisonment to go speak to these kings. That is the fulfillment of God's call on his life. This is Paul's moment of destiny. He's speaking to kings for his king of kings. And he's doing it from the perspective of Psalm 2, begging them, kiss the son. Love the son, choose the son, trust the son to cover your sin. There is no other way. If we only had this perspective of being an ambassador of Christ's kingdom. It changes how we see our suffering and our weakness. That those very moments where we feel helpless, hopeless, chained by circumstances, those are the moments that are the moments of destiny, moments of fulfillment of God's plan for saving us. There's a a Nine Marks article titled Political Gospel. And it says this. And don't get hung up on any one little phrase or statement in here. Hear the whole statement. The best way we can be politically subversive, in other words, countering uh, ungodly government, is not marching downtown. It's not seeking to install new judges who agree with us. It's not electing presidents who will promote Christian values, though all of these things might be limited goods. No, the best thing we can do to establish strong uh, is to establish strong kingdom-minded churches who proclaim the gospel of Christ that transcends any earthly party or politician. That does not that is not to say don't attend a rally. It's not to say don't, don't vote for Christian leaders. It is to say, above all, do whatever is necessary to build up the church, to live out the character and values of Christ's kingdom, and to declare the way into it. You see, the church has one message. It is not a Republican message. It is not a democratic message. It is the gospel message. There is one hope for America, and it is the gospel. And yet, we don't proclaim it. And we don't live it in a way that the world can see the way life is in the kingdom. So whatever engagement we have with the politics of this earthly kingdom, it must be done as citizens of heaven, as ambassadors of Christ, and one more thing, as soldiers. As soldiers of Christ. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. It says this, Share in suffering. Don't let me lose you there, okay? Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him, his recruiter, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we are the Lord's army. I almost want to say, I may never, what is it? March in the me, fly over. Shoot the artillery, I may never me, but I'm in the Lord's army. There we go. All right, you're on the same page, and now you're awake again. Okay, so we are the Lord's army. We live to please him, to follow his commands, even when that leads to suffering and or death. But remember, remember, that means our enemy against whom we fight is not flesh and blood. And we talked in our uh, young adult Bible study Friday night. We have a, an amazing group of young adults. It, it is, e- even though they made it a night where you dress up in 80s rocker clothes, 
And so the pastor and his wife come in 80 rocker clothes and not one other person dressed up in 80 rocker clothes. There's still a really amazing group of young marrieds. Yeah. Um, but, but what we talked about there was in Jeremiah 17, it says that, that our heart is totally untrustworthy. It is so deceived. And one way that it's deceived regularly is we see flesh and blood and we put a big E on the forehead, enemy, enemy. And, and if we're in the Lord's army, people, they may act like the enemy. They may do the bidding of the enemy but they are not the enemy. They are uh, enslaved to sin if they don't know Jesus Christ, and sinners sin. I mean, they have more of an excuse than we do, right, in sinning. So we need to remember the enemy against we fight, whom we fight, is not flesh and blood. It is spiritual. Uh, we also need to remember the weapons of our warfare are not flesh and but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. With weapons of righteousness on the right hand and the left, 2 Corinthians 6, 7. We need to make sure our weapons are not just, well, let's have another church event. Right? Let's do, let's keep our calendar full. If we're not on our knees in prayer, we're not going to accomplish anything more than a civic organization could. And so we need to make sure we know, know the enemy, arm yourself with the word of God, the sword of the spirit and prayer. Paul says uh, of, the, of the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. What a, what a thing to be able to say. As soldiers of Christ, our marching orders are to be found pleasing to the recruiter, our captain. You know, how amazing. It is Memorial Day where we remember the lives of those sacrificed. They gave their lives for their country, and we remember them for that. Church, may the world remember us when we're gone that we gave our lives fighting the good fight of faith. May that be what they, they, they remember of us. So the question is, are we fighting more for a political party, more for a political policy or philosophy or platform than we are for personal holiness, than we are for the holiness of those brothers and sisters that are sitting on each side of us, than we are fighting for kingdom expansion by the proclamation of the gospel? Which battle is our highest priority? Whose soldiers are we? We are soldiers of Christ. And our primary mission is to resist the enemy, the devil, and pray for those who are enslaved to do his will, that they will fall in step behind King Jesus. What weapons are we wielding? We are uh, employing spiritual weapons. Uh, it's funny, Henry Ford, and look, I'm not, uh, commending Henry Ford to you. He had a bunch of wacky views too. Um, but he said one thing that I believe to be correct. He says, as long as we look to legislation to cure poverty or to abolish special privilege, we're going to see poverty spread and special privilege grow. Government's not the answer. More government is not the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Uh, and so I just reiterate, to accomplish a spiritual task, we employ spiritual weapons. Yet we rarely pray or share the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. I would love to see on a Wednesday night this place just packed to pray. Just to, to spend time lifting each other up, to praying for the lost, praying for our ministries, for Kaya, for our children's ministry, for our uh, unexpected pregnancy closet for our children's closets and our, our ladies' closet. And I mean, just that those ministries for our men's ministry, for our women's ministry, for our student ministry, for uh, you name it, for our college ministry, that, that we would be praying and saying, God, 
fall on these ministries and do what only you can do. Spiritual weaponry. And so we have to ask, what weapons are we trying to wield as soldiers of the cross? So let's not stop working and praying, church, that God's will be done by our rulers on earth as it is in heaven. Don't stop that, all right? Let's confront them when they are a terror to righteousness, and let's do that with gentleness and respect, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, but let's aim higher. Let's have the aim of our recruiter who desires that all come to faith in Christ. Let's pray that God will grant them repentance. When was the last time you prayed for your president that God would grant him repentance? For our, our Congress, for our Senate, that God would grant them repentance and that they would come, if they don't already know Christ, they would come to the truth and they would kiss the Son and fall in love with him. And let's do this by not forgetting who we are in Christ's kingdom. You know, we are citizens by faith in Christ. We are ambassadors of Christ, representing the king. We are soldiers of Christ, fighting for the increase of the king's rule in our hearts and in this world. And as, as citizens, ambassadors, and soldiers, may our loyalty to Christ be undeniable. May his righteousness in us be irrefutable. May his love in us be unmistakable. His grace toward his creation, may it just be irresistible. And may our trust in his rule be unquenchable. And if you're not a citizen yet, if you're not an ambassador of Christ, if you're not a soldier of Christ, may today be the day when you switch sides, when you stop trusting in your own works to make you acceptable to the King of Kings, and you start trusting in what Christ did alone on the cross who died in our place to take the punishment we deserve for our sin so that he could give us his perfect righteousness in return as a free gift. And may he become your savior and your king today. You see, only citizens will gain entrance into the kingdom of God in the end. His kingdom is righteousness. It is peace. It is joy in the Holy Spirit. And there is no righteousness apart from faith in Christ. So let's not just be those who seek God's kingdom. Let's be those who seek it first. And I want to close with a verse from 1 Timothy 1. Verse 17. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, may we be clearly citizens of your kingdom. May we speak rightly as ambassadors of Christ. And may we fight with all of our strength courageously as soldiers of Christ for personal holiness, for the holiness of this local church, and for the evangelization of Beckley and West Virginia, our country and the world. May we be soldiers who please you who recruited us. Father, be with those who don't know you yet. Draw them near by the Spirit. Be irresistible to them. Let them see your people. And by, by the lives of your people, Father, and by your word and Spirit, let them trust in Jesus Christ to be their King. In his name we pray. Amen.